Well, thanks a lot to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here and to see so many friends. Um, I would like to start with a word of explanation of what the title means. There are really two parts to this talk, which, of which I will conservatively only cover one, given that I've been given the unlikely role of a responsible person and Olivier the even more unlikely role of a disciplinarian. <laughs> and in the first part, we will be talking about physical learning. That is to say how active mechanics can be used to get materials to learn at least some preliminary ideas in that direction. And the second part that I would have loved to, to say something, I can still talk one-to-one, -one, is how to use machine learning, so in silico version of what those materials are trying to do, to um, infer uh, equation underlying active mechanics directly from experimental data. It's something I find somewhat thought-provoking, because it's the other way around how I was taught to do physics, because you start with experiment, infer the equation and the interpretation comes at the end. When I was a student, they taught us that first comes the interpretation, then plausible equation, and then comparison. Okay. But um, it's also very staggering when you try to reproduce in synthetic material what nature can do in biology to see what you are up, up against or trying to imitate, and humbling, I would say. So let me start with the physical learning. So the basic idea, um, so first of all, some people say, why physical learning? Learning is always physical. As Landau used to say, information is, is, is physical, is always encoded in physical things. Even, even the machine learning you do on your computer, this, this, this physical object, the neurons are physical objects. But the word physical learning is used less generically in modern research, um, and it really denotes an, an aspiration to create materials using a different pipeline than, say, computational design, in which in a computer or in your notebook, you put all the building blocks, then the material gets built and you will have the property that you decided at the time you constructed, no feedback with deployment. Another thing that you can do, of course, is that you can deploy a material, uh, take some input, and then re-put it in a computer, that input from the environment, to readjust the uh, parameter uh, that characterizes the material. Of course, that requires the computer to be attached and to carry it with it. Now, in physical learning, the aspiration is that the system will be autonomous. That is to say, it adjusts its property, for example, the value of the interactions, as a function of the input to achieve non-trivial functionalities. And um, this is a nice review, in my opinion, by one of my colleagues, uh, um, Arvin Murugan. And uh, this book, which I co-wrote with uh, Zorana Dracic and Vin Van Salos, in chapter 10, has a whole uh, host of background material that is used for, in particular, discussion of opfield model that will come later. And um, um, Zorana herself is actually a pioneer in this field, and um, kind of she wrote it. <laughs> uh, now, um, these are ideas that are a little bit in development, but as anything in life, they do take inspiration for things that have been around for a while, and also classical material science. And in, as you will see in this talk, most of our discussion will uh, in, involve two steps, one that I'm going to call training, and, and one I'm going to call retrieval. Okay, so I want to illustrate that in the context of the shape memory alloys. So in shape memory alloys, you can actually mold the alloy by a combination of mechanical perturbations or others, and say lock it in a strange shape like this. Okay, so this gets done, this is what you call the training. Then what you can do is, once you're done with this, and you've chosen the target functionality, here is just a shape, you can go in and start this wire in a completely different configuration, potentially even straight, then apply a mechanical perturbation, sorry, perturbation, here it's, you heat it up, and it will reform the same thing that you had been trained to have. If you want to see it in a more movie-like fashion, so this is what, this is the end of the training, um, then you re-stretch it, even this nice music, and uh, now you apply the heating, this is the perturbation, and it will, it will restore, hence the name memory, the configuration it was programmed to have, okay? And now, this is a bit of a background material, but there's been more recent attempt that I'm gonna try to uh, describe later um, to, involve, to incorporate this idea, either in the design of metamaterials or in the design even of materials. So this is a theoretical paper by Zoran Avrind and uh, Leibler and Brenner. Um, but one of the features about, uh, to the best of my knowledge, of the majority of this uh, 
systems is that what is being learned is a static property. For example, you learn how to assemble a lattice, or rather, the lattice that you assemble. You learn the moduli. The question that we had was, what are the physical conditions for learning dynamical behaviors in materials? What I mean by dynamical behavior is that you want to learn the pathway that leads to something, or a, a dynamical steady state, even of the simplest form. Okay? And we have assembled a team of people who have studied this problem. They include Ritu Parno Mandal, now at Bangalore as a faculty, previously at Chicago as a postdoc, Rosalind Wang, an undergraduate at Chicago, now at MIT, with Julien, and um, uh, um, Michel Frouchard, uh, previously at Chicago as a postdoc, now at SP ESPCI, uh, Pepin Moorman in Eindhoven, my colleague Arvin Murugan, and uh, uh, Suri Van Kunatan. And we have a preprint with a, a first version of this story. Let me try to tell you what is it that we want to do. And let me start with a schematic. Just to give you an idea of what we mean in the tri most trivial law setting by learning a dynamical state. So you start by training the material and imagine that you took this origami bird and the training was literally to move the wing as if you're imitating the oscillatory motion that will get this thing to fly. And more formally, an operator imposed a time-dependent state on the system. During the state of training, the physical property, the fabric or the material of which this thing is made because of some form of plasticity, changes as a function of the stimuli applied. You can sort of see the origin in biology of many of these things. Then there is a retrieval phase in which the system no longer changes in terms of its basic constituents, but it will be able to undergo this limit cycle motion. Okay? And please notice here the emphasis that the most trivial example is still a time-dependent one. So what you learned, if you like, in training, what you want to learn in training, it's not a fixed point of an energy landscape, which is what my colleagues were doing, but say a limit cycle or something dynamic. And you can sort of see why the active matter ingredient can, can be really uh, instrumental to achieve that. So the ingredient here is that when you view your material, perhaps this is more appropriate for solid, but to some extent also for fluid, you can view it as a bunch of particles connected by the interactions that this particle ex experience. Uh, I and J denote, say, two, par two such particles. And then you will always have a JIJ, which is just a, ma a matrix that parameterizes the interaction between the two. This matrix need not to be symmetric because the interaction can be di directional. And the, the crucial thing in these problems maybe compared to other things about you know, reciprocal interaction that you heard either me or others talking about, is that here we're really concerned about the evolution of the network. The JIJ undergo a dynamics during training. That is to say, when you're exposed to examples, the way the particles interact changes. At the end of training, it's fixed, but during training, it changes. When viewed as a network theory problem, this is a bit of a funny one, because usually the network people like to talk about topology. But here, the embedding in geometrical space is crucial because this interaction JIJ will depend on some coordinates, positions, angles, whatever physical coordinate. So it will be very generically two coupled system of differential equations. Okay? So, and one inspiration that evidently comes from neuroscience um, is this notion that in neurons, this plasticity of the interaction does exist. I mean, probably what led to my brain and yours. Uh, is, is indeed that, that process that even intuitively you would call learning. But, uh, you know, the, the most caricature picture of that is this expression, fire together, wire together. So um, when there is a physical state of synchronous firing, then the way the two neurons, or the two particles in this case, interact gets changed as a function of that. This is the feedback I'm trying to capture here. But often in real neurons, but also in real materials, this rule need not to be synchronous. In particular, if you emit a signal, any type of signal in nature, there's always a time it takes to be received. And this delay does occur in, uh, of course, between neurons as well. And in that context, this delay, so this has to do with the together part, leads, is called STDP, spike timing dependent plasticity. And the crucial thing for us is that if there is such a delay, then I and J are not equivalent anymore. 
So you can introduce an asymmetry because one is emitting and the other one is before the other. So what I'm trying to say is that any form of causal or causality that you impose on the, the problem can lead to the, an asymmetry in the JIG. Okay? And so um, this is the first ingredient that we're going to be using. No, please do. Uh, yeah, uh, where, where can I give the mic to Shiran? No, I was just saying that without the delay, the point is if the rule is just fire together, wire together, then it's implicitly it has to be symmetric. Absolutely. So you, yeah, you know. Yeah. And so what you, I'm saying is that if you, do a, yeah, if you do have been learn a fire together, wire together, um, you restrict yourself in what can be done. And what I'm saying, maybe unsurprising, I don't want to restrict myself. And, and more crucially, as you will emerge, causal interaction between particles in the media will give you that knob to play with. And you're going to see that momentarily. So, because being myself, I thought that the best way to introduce the mathematics with done was via toys. And so <laughs> we bought it. This, this is quite sophisticated by my standard because it entails LIGO, but LIGO with robots or with motors entailed with it. And why do we need these motors? Because essentially what we've introduced, uh, and this guy should play, um, a sort of XY spin model, but with a communication delay in the rule of interaction between them. Okay? You don't even need to know the details of how this interaction is put, because in this case we really build it in in the toy. I'm going to show you more detail about more physical ones. But the thing that I would like to stress is because of this communication delay, the way two interacts with one is different from how one interacts with two. Okay? So that's the only thing I want to take away. And that's the first ingredient to keep in mind. The physical system is capable of learning non-reciprocal interactions or non-symmetric interactions. Now, the question that, um, since the game here is not to have the non-reciprocal interaction to start with, but to acquire during the training, the question is, what examples are you shown during training. I mean, you could argue that I could have become a sinner. We're both Italian, we both play tennis, and we both have muscles. But evidently, something in the training of a champion is different from an amateur. And so here, of course, we have a much simpler problem, which is what type of motions of the physical degrees of freedom, which in this case are the angles that those two guys make, should we do during the training process in order to produce dynamical steady state? And here is something that will not work. This is a training that is time reversal symmetric, okay? Applied to a system that is capable of having non-reciprocal interaction. But the training itself is absolutely symmetric. If I try to do retrieval, and I have this toy in my portable lab, which is in that bag, what you're going to see is that the only thing that I can learn is for these two guys to interact and to align. That is to say, the only thing that I can learn is a fixed point of an energy landscape. I'm not learning anything dynamical. Even if the system has potentiality for doing uh, um, non-reciprocal uh, interaction, it just doesn't acquire it in, as a function of time. Okay? Now, let's see what, uh, what happens if you take the same system and the training that you're applying explicitly break time reversal symmetry. That is to say, if you flip the arrow of time, you can see a manifest difference, uh, even on average. Well, here is an example of a training. You see, the operator goes in, he moves it around. It's pretty obvious that they go clockwise, what is it, counterclockwise? So clearly, there is an arrow of time that will flip. And now let's see what happens if you um, um, deploy the system. Now, the learning of the interaction has already been done. Okay? And um, you apply, and you can see that it picks up a dynamical steady state. Okay? So the, the, if I want to explain to you, or justify what you've seen, I propose that we construct a toy model of the toy, okay? Or in a, more, in a, less, in a somewhat more potential way, a non-reciprocal upfield model. So the model that we're going to consider is the simplest that you can cook. You can also describe exactly the toy, which is a somewhat more difficult uh, interaction, as uh, Okay, this is, you assume that instead of having angles, you just have spins that are continuous variables. This is the rule for the dynamics of the spin. But more crucially, there is a rule for the rate of change 
of the interactions. Okay? And the rate of change of the interactions, notice that as an explicit time delay, that is the one that we encoded in the toy. Okay? And now, this is a, an advantage of being somewhat uh, simple to the point that an undergraduate, a good undergraduate can solve it, and indeed that's what Rosalind did. And, um, and what we've done here is that the protocol for training that we've applied is just a, a sinusoidal variation of the uh, spins. Please notice that there's two spins, okay, as you saw. In, and this sinusoidal or, or periodic variation can be done in two ways. Either both of the spins are done in absolute synchrony, so, so there isn't one that lags behind the other always. This is one in which time reversal symmetry is unbroken. You, you, you can't see that there is one lagging behind. And as you apply manually the oscillation of the spins, notice that the, this object, which is the asymmetric part of the interaction matrix, stays equal to zero. Whereas the symmetric part acquires, as a function of time, a steady state value. As a result, during retrieval, this is during training. After training, the evolution stops at the Js. So you take whatever happened at infinity, you run your experiment, and what you see is that the two Si and Sj um, converge to a static parameter at, at infinity. Now notice what happens if you do the same protocol, but now one of the two spins clearly runs behind the other. This is my attempt to model the clockwise thing. Notice that in this case, the, and in fact, uh, we, we tuned it to be maximal, the, the effect. Notice that now there is a, an asymmetric part that gets learned a long time. Okay? And the learning of this asymmetric part, if you stop then the interactions at the t equal infinity, and you now have nearly zero symmetric one and a seizable antisymmetric one, will lead to oscillatory behavior of the two spins, which is the limit cycle that we've described before. Okay? And this is essentially, you can do the same exercise also for the toy, if you like. But what I find more interesting, but first of all, I want to show you something more realistic than this. But the other thing I want to just plant a, a seed in your mind is that um, this is a non-reciprocal version of the Opfield model. The Opfield model typically describes associative memories. This is, uh, the non-reciprocal version is able to recall sequences. That's why you can do the pathways. Um, in, typically, in the Opfield model, this JIJ, it's a, it's a random object, right? And so I want to just flash a slide of advertisement that there is work done with, by Giulia Lorenzana, um, Ad Altieri, Michel Fouchard, Giulio Biroli, and myself on uh, spin glasses with uh, similar characteristics. This is just a, a, an intermezzo. Let me get back to the main uh, line of the story in the simplest possible context. There are two ingredients that we have delineated and using a little bit of green function gymnastic, you can prove mathematically in a variety of models that are needed to generate dynamical behavior in physical system through learning. One is the possibility of learning non reciprocal interaction. So your system must have that ability of supporting them. And the second one is that during the training, you've got to show the system um, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking examples. Otherwise, uh, it will not evolve to that potentiality that it has. They're somewhat intuitive, a bit a touch more complex to prove. Yeah? Are you saying this is sufficient or this is necessary? Uh, so we are in the process of formalizing like the theorem. I think at this point, I would say we've done three examples, uh, proved in those three examples, convinced ourselves uh, intuitively. And I'm going to show you why uh, that is it's necessary. Yeah, that they are necessary. Yeah. So in your simple model, uh, two slides so, back, yeah, David. Yes. In your simple model, uh, two slides back, uh, there was a tau. Yeah. Could you not have a tau ij, which itself is asymmetric? You mentioned that, but in your model, I thought tau was uh, just independent of index. Uh, yeah, in, in, this is because I, you saw I, I wrote a toy model of the toy. Okay. Um, now, the actual toy, uh, I, um, it also doesn't have that complication that you're saying, that you're describing. Uh, if you wanted to know what it was, it would be simply, oh, uh, pardon, excuse, excuse, uh, 
and skip slide. Um, you see here, the, okay, the degree of freedom are a little bit different, their angles. They are all this, you know, this is a, the usual equation of motion for a, an XY model, if you like. Now the JJ evolve. And here what happens, just because of the, how the toy is built, ask Leo, uh, ask Ligo <laughs> for, for an explanation. Here there's a kernel, a memory kernel. This memory kernel is an exponential in tau in t minus tau one. And, um, and, uh, and so you can no longer flip i and j in here because uh, this g is not that symmetric. And so this is what we're trying to mimic. And in here, the only thing that matters is this time delay. But the actual time delay between the two elements of the toy presumably involves propagating a signal between them, and that's symmetric. Yeah, we are assuming that it's just a fixed time delay. Okay? Thank you. Now, one thing I want to show is to, so go back a bit to here and say, okay, this is uh, a little bit uh, abstract or with toys. Can we make a little bit of steps towards going in, in the direction of soft materials? And of course, I mean, ultimately, this is, this is also what will require, you know, the, the wisdom and the ingenuity of experimentalists. I don't think that this has been done yet. But we did take a little bit of inspiration from some of our colleagues, in particular, Pepin Mormon, who is a co-author here, was a, an author of a very beautiful work in Nature Chemistry 2020. I dare say, I'm going to explain a little bit the idea, at least in an idealized way, that a lot of this work on chasing, uh, uh, how do you call it, chasing oil droplets is rooted, I don't know if rooted is the right word, but um, I learned a lot about that before this experiment from this paper by uh, Shri Ram and, um, and um, Ramin and uh, Saha. And after that, there's been a lot of interest for this topic, including my own. But um, let me tell you a little bit what is, the, what is the story behind this paper and how we think uh, could help to realize that, or at least maybe can give you some ideas to experimentalists in the audience to do uh, something more reason reasonable. So first of all, first ingredient, and as you see this, while we took inspiration, please try, I'm gonna try to emphasize it, try to see the generality of what we're doing, because I believe it's there. So we're gonna assume that this oil, that this dro these are uh, droplets, they are particles. This particle emits a field. Now, this field is called CI. I denotes the two type of particle. This particle one and this particle two. Here, there are oil droplets that emit oil that is inside them in, in, in outside. There's micelles, but this is a general setup. There is an evolution of a field emitted by the particles. There is a finite radius of interactions for this um, field to propagate. There's a characteristic time scale. This is a decay rate, and this is diffusion. That's the first ingredient. This physical field doesn't have to be something chemical. It could be something acoustic that you emit. The second thing that we're going to demand is that the particles themselves, whose center of mass are denoted by Ri, in this case the droplets, move. They're self-propelled. And the propulsion, of course, they interact by some interactions that are mediated by Marangoni forces, etc. In this case, there's some noise. And notice that the, the propulsion of this particle transforms what could have been an isotropic emitted field into a comet-like thing, giving the possibility that one behind will have a different reaction with one in front. Maybe you can see a bit the connection with those earlier work by uh, uh, Sriram, for example. Okay? Now, the second ingredient here, though, or the third, if you like, is that the way they move the way they propel, or rather the direction in which they propel, this is a bit rooted in the physics of the system, depends on gradients of concentration emitted by another particles nearby. Okay? Because here, by Marangoni forces, they're moving in gradients of the concentration of the oil. Okay? Now, this omega ij is the crucial object that um, um, that, um, if you like, generalize is a proxy for the GIJ in, uh, in this problem. It's like, a, if you like, a mobility. It tells you how much you move, how much I moves, in response to a gradient of concentration emitted by the particle J. I believe that maybe Julien also, and maybe Christina, have models that have some physics of this sort. But the crucial part that, I, what, that we want 
to, so that we can start talking about learning is the, is the second equation. An equation of, of motion, if you like, or evolution for the omega ij. And what this equation is saying, and it's plausible given the physics of that system, is that the, 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 the affinity increases if the level of concentration exceeds the average and decays with a certain rate. Now, with this equation, now you have a system, if you like, this is my uh, real world, uh, pseudo real world version of what I wrote in the first slides of the, D, uh, the J dot, J I J dot, and the DR dot. This is an instantiation of that, which is understandably a little bit more complicated. If you take a simplified assumption, and you assume that this one, instead of having a finite radius, is just a delta function in the emission of the C field, then you can actually you see, eliminate this implicit dependence on C for the omega, and you can write down an evolution for the omega in terms of a retarded green function. At the bottom line here, this is really the, the main message, is the learning delay emerged from any causal interactions that is mediated by a field. Now, in, this, in the example of, the, of, of our friends uh, with, the, with the droplets, of course, you have to move sufficiently fast for that deformation to happen. So it all depends on the Peclé number. In other applications, there will be some other dimensionless parameter. But the root is just this. Time asymmetric delay in the learning rule emerge with any causal non-instantaneous interaction, which means that at least in principle, this happens all the time in nature, potentially. How big the effect is will depend on how fast you move relative to other time scales. And we did a bit more analysis for this system. Now, I just want to show what happens if you take that system now instead of the trivial uh, spins. And um, we wanted to teach it to move, move, move to, to be a one-dimensional solid that moves around always on a ring. Okay? And um, this is training. Notice that during training, omega ij and omega ji between two particles, one above and the other one below, five minutes left, yeah, are evolving in an asymmetric manner, meaning one of them is much larger than the other. So you clearly picked up a non I don't know, non-symmetric, um, if you don't want to call it interaction, you can call it uh, cross-mobility. This is uh, one, two, three, I don't know, 10 particles. But since there is symmetry in this configuration, you can just concentrate on a pair, and I'm showing here for that pair, and I could show it for any other pair, but aside from noise, you would see the same thing, namely that you pick up a long time uh, in asymmetry in the mobility. Okay? So this is the training. Now, so this is, again, by training I mean you impose this thing, you run those equations, those equations will evolve the omega, this is what you get. This you can actually even calculate it analytically because this ring you can put it for two particles and, and there is more in our paper on this song and that. Now, this is the retrieval. This is what happens when you take the interactions learned at the end of the period of training. Now you assume that you drastically change the Peclet number so things cannot change. You, you, you know, now the system is off uh, its father or mother and goes, gets deployed in the field. You start with this random configuration a little bit like the wire that had been straightened in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the alloy problem, and see what happens. They chase each other a bit, they move around a little bit, but at the end, what they do is that they form a ring that is you know, not perfect, but is more or less the functionality. And it's trivial, admittedly, but it's a time-dependent functionality manifest. Can remember the order? Huh? Can remember the order? Um, the, the order, like the sequence, the particles here are identical. So I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't assemble, if you like, I didn't put one, two, three, four, five on the particle. But they, but they do have, a, 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 you know, they pick up the clockwise. Here is another example. Now here, what we want, it's a bit more uh, uh, contrived, uh, not contrived, but maybe less obvious. <laughs> we want uh, a bunch of particles to form a, a little crystal spaceship. <laughs> that chases uh, another, another alien <laughs> to kill. So, sorry for the militarized uh, analogy. But, so this is the training that we apply to the same system of equations. Now we start with this. You see, these guys don't, 
don't even have the right shape. This is the, the poor particle that's moving around. And um, you can sort of see the predation, the predator has, has built itself, is chasing uh, the gazelle, and here it comes, catches it, <laughs> and incorporates it. Okay, so these are like primitive form of a time-dependent functionality, evidently by Inspired. And just as an advertisement, I would like to say that together with Denny Bartolo and uh, um, um, Jonathan Colan and uh, Alexis Ponce, we have developed some machine learning techniques that take, uh, uh, you know, data from Deni, where Deni really streams particles, <laughs> and we extract non-reciprocal interaction from data directly and learn the equation for how, for example, sound moves in this things. I don't have time to... No, you have to conclude. Yeah, so he, he, the, the disciplinarian here says that I have to conclude. Um, and, but this paper does exist, and one of the author uh, um, uh, um, is, I think, in the audience. I will be talking later, and, uh, and hence, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this extremely illuminating talk. And so, look at that. Yeah, yeah, we, perfect. It started even one minute you. late. Huh? <laughs> so I guess there are plenty of questions. So we need a little bit of rigor here. Let's start at the first front, and then we'll, we'll go this way, please. And well, you have to move to the microphone or take mine. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. It was uh, crystal clear and allows me to ask a very direct question. So in the first part, you were referring to shape memory and material science. There, uh, something uh, similar but different to what you have done is handled with internal variables, yeah. where uh, internal variables are by definition things on which uh, forces cannot work directly and they have their own dynamics. Yeah. Right, and uh, to make a long story short, you decide to freeze the training at some point and then your system becomes frozen while uh, there could be uh, other dynamics, etc. And this uh, raises to me the question, of uh, why do you choose to work with interaction as uh, opposed to other things and whether uh, there is uh, somehow, it boils down to uh, physics that is not uh, described explicitly. And so, okay, also the yeah. delay is this feature, so comments on this, thank you. I think quite, quite a few interesting points raised by uh, Antonio. First one, there's one figure of that paper that I did not show. <laughs> in which we address precisely the issue, what if the training and the retrieval overlap a bit in time? So there's not a clear demarcation. After all, in many situations, it may not be possible to just dramatically switch it off. Please notice in the example of the droplets moving in oil, if you do retrieval and training at very different Peclet numbers, you can actually achieve that condition arbitrarily close. But more broadly, you had another question. Okay, besides this detail, which is however important, uh, what about doing it in different ways? Why do you start from a microscopic view of interactions? Well, um, the, the other way to do it, and we're a bit in the process of doing that now, is to take a continuum mechanics view, maybe with, with um, um, internal variable as well, so that uh, um, you can mimic the phase transformation that exists in the alloy. But our um, belief um, is that, or at least what we're trying to do now, is that some of the constraint on non-reciprocity will have to enter the mechanics that you use. Uh, that's not impossible. <laughs> in fact, there are, there's a spe there are two, two specialists who are going to be talking about these things in uh, the something called elasticity. For example, there is a way of introducing the non-reciprocity, not at the level of the microscopic forces, but directly at the level of the continuum equation. And, um, and this is, you know, you're hitting essentially one of the things that we're doing at the moment. Okay, so since there are plenty of questions, please formulate the questions quickly and uh, answer briefly. Go <laughs> 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 you are really uh, in the, enjoying the role, eh, my friend. <laughs> so here, you really have to be a puppet master in the sense that you have to control everyone of uh, every single degree of freedom. I wonder if what happens if you only can access, can train only like a subset of the degree of freedom, uh, and does it scale? So, what do you expect? Puppet master, why I like, uh, <laughs> you know, I, you know maybe this is his aspiration, I like that. Uh, maybe not quite so powerful, meaning uh, in, the, in the droplet ones, you don't individually need to access them. They do it by themselves a little bit when put in condition of flow. 
but I agree with you that at the end, each of them will do it. Um, but, I, you know, we are not individually acting on each of them. Do you see what I mean? You, you, um, except during the training, perhaps, when you move them on that, that's, that's what you're alluding. Yeah, during the training, yeah. yeah. So one of the things that I don't remember how much we tried, but uh, I, I think Ritu Parno did some simulations. What happens if one or two of them are faulty? In fact, we may have a, we have a, uh, um, how to call it, a figure or a, a, a figure called sloppy training. So this is either something in the training that you do or something in the responsiveness of the particle that goes off. And there's a, there is a certain degree of robustness to it, but we haven't explored this systematically. I mean, what fraction do I need to get right before the other ones, uh, before it still works within a certain... Actually, I think that you and I have done something in your platform that, that may be a good place to address that question. Okay, let's go to the next question. Yeah, so a question related to, uh, to this one. How do you really ensure that this is the only attracting limit cycle that you're going to con converge to? Does that depend also on the initial condition? So yeah. the training, does it make sure that the learned dynamic has only that as, a, as an attractive? Yeah. As in, uh, that's as in that's an excellent question. And uh, so um, the most honest thing that I can have to declare right away is that you saw that the complexity of the example was such that we did not choose one where there were like 25 attractors in a small region of phase space. Uh, typically, what I would imagine, so, but-, but how, how do you know that, uh, Vincenzo? Because that, that you don't know. That depends on the omega ij that you're learning. Uh, because I'm showing what works and not what doesn't. Uh, okay. if, if you see what I'm saying? Like, uh, I mean, this procedure can also fail. Like, you can fail to train. And then the question is, under what condition do you fail to train? And actually, um, the, the, there's a figure at the end of this paper that is addressing a little bit that. Namely, what if there's multiple attractors? And uh, there what we do is that we bias by initial conditions. I cannot say if this is just um, a statement about our sophistication at the moment or an absolute necessity. Another way I could imagine is also to enhance mechanism of jumping out on, but, yeah. Speaking of, speaking of things failing to work, uh, we know uh, for a long time that if you introduce too much delay in a feedback system, you get a lot of terrible instabilities and bad things happen. Uh, yeah. Have you seen anything like that uh, in the uh, you know, so one thing that cycles uh, and non-alien chasing so results? So I would like to go to this, actually, if you may. Uh, so this is uh, this work done with our, with our friends at the, at the NS in Paris. So um, the PQ... This is some update rule. It, this is a model of a spin glass. To answer your question, in the world of spin glasses, this JIJ would be a random matrix. And there's a very fundamental and um, um, inspirational, at least to me, uh, many others, uh, work by Sompolinsky and Crisanti. This is a work going back to maybe at least 30 years. It was this gentleman did, they proved that when you have an all to all one coupling of this JIJ, and there is um, noise, or there is a disorder. This is a model of spin glass, so JIJ is a random object. Then all the beautiful things that we talk about, the cycles, gets destroyed, and generically you get chaotic dynamics. Sompolinsky Crisanti. Now, with Giulio and, uh, and the gang, we started asking does this result depend on the topology of the connection? In particular, in many of the problems that we have, you may have two species of things, each of which is a complex system, maybe represented by a, a spin glass, with an asymmetric coupling between the two species. So we studied a model in which there is a spin glass, there is disorder, but the asymmetry only exists between the two bipartite macroscopic components. And what we found is that in that case, chaotic dynamics is suppressed. There's this spin glass uh, phase, and there is aging with coherent oscillations. So the answer to your question is that depends a little bit on how you put this perturbation, but even in disorder system, if there is still this bipartite structure of two species, two type of droplets, at least this preliminary result suggests that there is a chance of re still retaining those coherent oscillations. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. So uh, I want to ask things in both your examples, you're learning J. Uh, the matrix J and omega as time dependent, yeah. but eventually they reach a steady state. So I'm wondering if you can just make them time independent parameters and start a learning process at when. Oh yeah, absolutely. But you see, this is a game that the, several of us have done for 
for the last, the last few years. I mean, I think it, I uh, apologize. I, you know, if I had to put all the references to people just in this room who have done that game in the last three years, uh, probably even my own would be too, too, too many. Uh, so that, what you're describing is a system with no reciprocal interaction. What, fun, what, what, what functionality can it display? And that's all that matters for the retrieval part. But for the learning, actually, the training part is the one that we are particularly interested in because we are interested in the question of accessing that state dynamically. So in principle, you see, to, to understand the logic of what we're doing is, imagine that you have, you have a world where there's no oscillation, say an overdamped system, so there's no inertia, there's no way of creating oscillation. And you start with interactions that are perfectly symmetric. But there is some mechanism that can create a non-reciprocal one. We want to understand whether this oscillation, whether inertia can be created even from scratch. So our question is really how you get to those JIJ that are asymmetric, less what you do once you have it. Then there is an explosion of activity that you'll hear even in the next talk about what happens once you have them. Okay. And maybe the, the, the minor thing that I'm saying, this time delay generically will give you that also for the perspective of learning. Anton? Very interesting talk. I had a, a simple question, which is how important is it that you're learning something periodic or that you have limit cycles, can you somehow relax that constraint? So we haven't done that, meaning uh, can you learn a pathway from a state to another? Um, I think that certainly the fact that we're learning something periodic makes our life easier, infinitely easier in the mathematics where we do this by hand, which I showed a little bit less. I do not see a reason of principle why the other cannot be done. Because essentially the essence of what we're saying, and, and I, I put it at the bottom of I don't know if this was sufficiently uh, sort of <laughs> uh, subtle, uh, in part because I haven't substantiated it with an example, but I'm, we're working on it, is the, the, the fact that what the non-reciprocity buys you is this ability to recall sequences. And I don't see why that would be suppressed uh, if the sequence is not periodic. But I haven't, I haven't done this, so you, you're spot Thank on you. in saying that that's uh, real. Yes, so. I have a similar question. So you mentioned that the time reversal symmetric orbits cannot be learned. Is, is that? Uh, so, so, sorry, so I think the time reversal symmetry, I think you mentioned that if you do have a symmetry, you only have a fixed point. Uh, during training. During training. During right? training. If you only see examples that do not know about the arrow of time, you will not learn a dynamical functionality so, that so involves that a path. So does that mean that you cannot learn the limit cycle that have such symmetry? Or is, that, is it that the such time reversal limit cycle is, does not exist in the first place? It just, no, it means, uh, I think, the, the second you said, namely, any, any uh, time-dependent state that itself um, is not on average uh, uh, time reversal symmetric, cannot be learned unless you have uh, a training where you, you see the instances of uh, um, time reversal symmetry break on average. Okay. It's also intuitive if you like, right? You can't learn something that you've not seen, it, it, not even quanti qualitatively. Uh, uh, hi, Vincenzo. This is uh, sort of related to David's question. Can you have um, a response before the stimulus, so like a mixture of positive and negative tails or some spectrum. It would be a, like an advanced wave in the field theory. Right? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, um, so here really is the rock bottom of simplicity as illustrated. In, 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 the, in, the, in the one that, that we have here, we have a retarded Green's function. Yeah. That can be in principle whatever will come out from eliminating this equation. So if you have a system where that naturally arises, and I can imagine many, the way you will be doing it is once you eliminate, uh, say, the dependence on the concentration of that field on the, on the variable, uh, and you obtain that Green's function, that Green's function will know. And the requirements that I'm saying come mathematically from analyzing the property and the symmetries of that Green's function. Right, right. So you can have it. On frame it's just that uh, the, what you're describing, uh, it's an instantiation of this, but not of the simple example. Christina? Okay, so very quickly and probably naively, but uh, so any viscoelastic material will have uh, interactions that are not local in time and space, actually. So, any, so you're saying that any such material can be trained to recall dynamical states? 
Uh, yes, but I would say that you, if you took that, you would trivialize the problem. Why? No, 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 but I don't mean it in a criticism way, but I'm just saying you will make your life a little bit easier. Right? If you want to do it, fine, but if you have elasticity in your medium, you already have inertia that allows you to do a cycle. So could be of a depth. Not exactly. This huh? elastic material means, say, you, know, you start with a fluid. You don't have any inertia. You actually have uh, Good. memory. Good. And in space Great. Data. So if you, uh, that's what I was saying, it don't make your life too easy. If you are in an overdamped regime, okay, then this problem is very analogous to this. And then you could, in principle, do it. And in a sense, this is what we're trying to, we, we, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I will take uh, the advantage of being to share to ask your last question, Vincenzo. <laughs> so here, when you were training, you were always training by performing the motion that you would get in the retrieval. What, uh, approximately. Approximately. What, what in the equation is responsible for that? Because you could imagine that you train the JIJ, they converge because, to something. Uh, no, 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 I can tell you. It's because in the equations that we have are equations for the physical variables, but the, but the omegas depends on the physical variable. Yes. So during training, that couple system transmits the perturbation that you're doing on the physical variable, the moving of the angles, to the way, for example, the GIJ change. So that's the feedback that you need. And that so is what the thing is in our That's the thing that you will need in this scholastic uh, model. You will need the feedback of course. <laughs> 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 <laughs>